Good afternoon, and thank you for staying to hear our presentation. So, um, when I was asked to do this, when we were asked to do this talk, I really questioned um, why are we been asked to stand on this stage. And Emma Cramp sent me a very lovely email, which said that, well, Katie, um, in October, compared with October 2017, um, Oxford and Oxfordshire had the greatest decrease in E. coli bacteremia infection rate. And you might be like me, you might be a little bit cynical and think, hmm, that's just statistics, it's just a blip. Um, but Lisa and I are going to showcase for you some of this work that we've been doing in Oxford, um, and you can make up your own mind, and we'll be very happy to hear any feedback that you may have for us. So this is data that I have taken directly off the fingertips database, and the green line is the rolling rate of uh, E. coli um, bacteremia across England. And you can see that if you look at the uh, top uh, greyish line, that Oxfordshire, we started out looking pretty good back in 2014. We were below the average rate for England, but we had a rapid rise through 2015 and 2016. And it looks as though that rise really is in our community onset cases. Um, but in fact, we're in pretty good company. Um, we're grouped in terms of complexity with a group of hospitals called the Shelford Group. Um, and nearly all of us in this complex group of hospitals, in terms of our hospital onset cases, have rates that are well above the average rate for England and rise and fall looking somewhat like a, a string of spaghetti. Um, so there's quite a lot of data, clearly, as you'll all be aware, that can be available on fingertips and you can play with to use for your uh, own purposes. Um, okay. Um, in Oxford, we're very lucky to work with um, an NHIR group of researchers, and they've established something called the Infections in Oxford Research Database. And this pulls together all microbiological and hospital electronic health records. And what I'm showing you here, actually, across the top four graphs are our um, E. coli bloodstream infections, and this is going right back to 1998, up to 2016. Um, and across the bottom, you've got our urinary tract infections. There are over 5,000 blood cultures represented across the top, and almost a quarter of a million urinary tract infections across the bottom. So this is good, solid data. Um, the first pair of graphs are our community um, onset. So these are patients who haven't seen the hospital for over a year. Then we've got quasi community, so they haven't been in touch with the hospital between a month and a year. Then quasi nosocomial, so they've been in touch with the hospital within the last month. And nosocomial, those with onset more than 48 hours into their hospital admission. And what you will see, particularly as we move um, into the era sort of post-2007, 2008, is that really the increase in E. coli bloodstream infection is very much driven by an increase in community and quasi-community bloodstream infection. And in fact, year on year in the latter part of those graphs, that's more than a 10% increase per year in the community. So we have a pretty good understanding of what's been going on leading up to the point where uh, NHS Improvement NHS England identified the need for us to do something about this. Now, this is looking at our much more recent data, and it comes right up to the end of January. Um, this is the same team modelling things in the same way, looking at our Oxfordshire data from 2015 to 2019. And they tell me that this represents a suggestion that we do have a genuine decrease in our gram-negative bloodstream infection in Oxfordshire. Now, this is not statistically significant. The p-value here is 0.08. But as I said earlier, we'll show you some of the things we've been doing that may have contributed to that. We've heard a lot today about the importance of stewardship. And one of the things that came out very strongly from that paper that I showed you looking at our data going back to 1998 is that the rate of rise of bloodstream infection due to carmoxiclav resistant E. coli far outweighs the rate of rise of carmoxiclav sensitive E. coli. That big increase is driven by carmoxiclav resistant E. coli. And if you happen to live, these are anonymized linked data, so we couldn't exactly say 
who had received carmoxiclav and who had resistance. But if you happen to live in a GP practice area where a lot of carmoxiclav was prescribed, in the following year, you were more likely to have a carmoxiclav resistant organism. So very clearly, that paper identified a big target for primary care um, to try and reduce high carmoxiclav use, and that, that might be effective in driving down resistant carmoxiclav bloodstream infection. Um, and data um, from the last year from our CCG suggests that, in fact, we may have achieved um, a marginal decrease in carmoxiclav prescribing. So a small decrease, but a decrease nevertheless. Now, when we put our data onto the um, HCI database, we have to come up with some kind of um, attribution. Do we think this is urinary-associated, hepatobiliary, etc.? And um, for, we believe for the last three years, we've had pretty consistent data entry in terms of allocating uh, our bacteremias to certain categories. Um, and what I'm showing you here um, is just the five most uh, frequent categories um, in our setting. 80% um, of our bacteremias are community onset and 20% hospital onset. But in both community and hospital, um, it looks as though we're seeing decreases in urinary tract associated bloodstream infections and in hepatobiliary. Um, clearly, we're not seeing very much reduction in gastrointestinal and unknown. Um, and I hypothesize, but we had to do the work on this, that a lot of this is due to our hematology oncology population, which is growing all the time, and a lot of gut translocation. There's going to be some presentations uh, next week led by Pat Cattini and others around cancer centers looking at that. But what we're going to show you now is some of the work that we've done, particularly around um, reducing uh, potentially urinary tract infection and hepatobiliary um, infections. I don't know if any of you were at a conference uh, before Christmas where Susan Hopkins stood up and gave a really uh, frightening statistic that really made us think. She pointed out papers that showed that if you look at community onset E. coli bloodstream infection in men over 50, between 7 and 18% of those bacteremias are um, associated with men who've had a transrectal prostate biopsy. And I thought, that's crazy. I don't believe that. But actually, looking at our own data, although it wasn't as dramatic as that, it was 4.4% um, of men in those five quarters from July 16 to September 17. And we already knew, because we had already done some work on this, which I'll show you in a moment, that our rate of um, E. coli bloodstream infection after trust prostate biopsy was around the 1% mark. So we'd been doing some work because our surgeons had had a small cluster um, over a, a two or three months, um, and they, they were very concerned about E. coli. Um, so we'd had 10 cases, giving us our overall infection rate of 0.9%. 60% of those cases were ciprofloxacin resistant, and most of those men had gone home and bounced back into the trust again very quickly with an amine of 2.6 days. Um, we had uh, an outbreak meeting involving all the usual suspects, and we had very good engagement from one of our urological surgeons, and in particular one of our um, advanced nurse practitioners who herself did many of the trust biopsies. And we did some audit work um, and uh, a look back and identified for um, areas for uh, closer examination the use of multi-use biopsy guns, um, the way that those guns and the ultrasound probes are decontaminated, and the fact that they weren't consistently documenting the timing of antibiotics prior to the procedure. We also wanted to have a look at the way they, uh, they decontaminate the rectum, which they, they use a big iodine-soaked sponge. Could that, was there any evidence that that contributes um, to increased infection? We wanted to see what um, uh, other areas, other, other hospitals who do trust biopsies do in terms of antibiotic prescribing and review our own local antibiotic resistance rates. And having done that review, um, perhaps not surprising, we recommended that they should move to single-use disposable guns. Um, we introduced um, an enhanced uh, level of disinfection. Review of the literature found no evidence to support uh, current bowel uh, preparation practices causing any increased infection, so that was continued. We didn't find anything consistent around with prescribing in other specialist centres, but we know that many specialist centres were, uh, were and are reviewing what uh, antibiotic prophylaxis they give. 
What we have done is a bit of a halfway house measure. We look at patients' uh, pre-procedure urine results and back at their previous results. And if there's any suggestion they are ESBL car carriers or have had cyproflocsin resistance in the past, they receive phosphomycin. Otherwise, we've continued for the moment with our usual prophylaxis of ciprofloxacin and metronidazole. But we have, uh, we're much more rigorous about when the antibiotics are given pre-procedure. Um, and just for information, our local E. coli ciprofloxacin resistance rate is 10%, and our phosphomycin resistant rate is 1%. So you've seen this slide before, apart from the red information. So after we put those interventions in, um, it, we do seem to have massively, well, significantly decreased um, the uh, number of uh, E. coli bacteremias in men over 50 that are due to trust prostate biopsy. Um, and we've also um, reduced the um, number of men who have a prostate biopsy who then get an E. coli infection. Neither of these results are significant, but on paper, they look quite good. I hope you'll agree. I'm going to hand over to my partner in crime, Lisa. That, that front slide said I was a consultant microbiologist. I'm not, so don't ask me any tricky questions. <laughs> what else have we done? We look at the Katie Lean work who, from the East Berkshire CCG who looked at hydration within her um, nursing homes and residential homes. They introduced seven hydration rounds a day and significantly reduced the number of patients or residents that were getting urinary tract infections and reduced by 36% the number of patients that were being admitted to hospital for treatment of a urinary tract infection. This is now being rolled out across Oxfordshire. Hmm. I don't think we'll have done anything different to the rest of you around CORTI prevention. We have the CORTI steering group, we've got a catheter passport, we've reviewed our e-learning, and that's the same e-learning package across the whole health economy. We validate all our safety thermometer data. And there's obviously a problem with how our ward staff are defining CORTI because we've actually, on validating the data, reduce the rates we're submitting by 50%. So there's some education to be done out there still. We're going to have our own hydration campaign within the trust. And we have a problem with documentation. So we can't tell you which of these things are working because we can't get people to reliably record when they've inserted a urinary catheter into our electronic database or when it comes out. So we don't actually know what's happening um, completely. We met with our hepatobiliary surgeons um, to see when the, the gram-negative bloodstream target came out to see what their thoughts were about how we could actually reduce the hepatobiliary gram-negative bloodstream infections. So we came up with the idea of the hot gallbladder service. And in fact, when Celia talked this morning, she talked about um, source control. And this is a good example of source control. So these patients that come in with cholecystitis are kept in until they have their gallbladder taken out. So it means that we're not seeing these patients bouncing back with um, gram-negative bloodstream infections. We're reducing our amount of antibiotics this cohort of patients are using. Plus, we get five to six thousand pounds for treating that patient on their primary admission. If we bring them back as an elective um, cholecystectomy, we only get two thousand pounds. So it's a win-win it's a situation for all of us. We have a trust-wide SSI group where we want all our specialities to monitor and report their SSI rates to our Hospital Infection Control Committee and also through their own clinical governance structure. We've introduced SSI bundles to a number of our surgical specialities now. And again, it's not rocket science. The bundles are short, 10 points, and it's shared ownership across the whole of the surgical pathway team. So it's things like, is your patient arriving warm? Are they getting the right antibiotics at the right time? The biggest difficulty I think we have is theatre behaviour, you know, encouraging surgeons to wear their masks over their noses to stop the traffic coming in and out. We're looking at glove changes, we're looking at um, standardising skin prep, we're standardising um, um, what we close with, we're moving to using a lot of glue because then our ward staff can actually see the wound once the patient gets back to the ward and then we can complete our wound assessment. Our wound assessment is electronic, and if the nurse or whoever's completing the wound assessment identifies there a trigger for um, a potential wound infection, our consultants are alerted via the electronic patient records to say that there's potential wound infection here. We also have um, a, an app developed in-house, which is on our 
um, ward iPads or your phone, whereby you can take a picture of the, the, the patient's wound and it's just translated, translated, transported straight to the electronic patient record. It doesn't sit on the staff member's phone, so there's no information governance concerns. Do the bundles work? Well, we've seen some really good results. This is hepatobiliary surgery, where we've halved a lot of our rates of SSI. We introduced a bundle into our paediatric spinal um, service in June. Since June, we've had one superficial in wound infection. And in fact, our surgeon said it was a, a very small superficial wound infection. Um, we've also um, reduced our SEU surgical emergency rates of infection from 21% to 4%. So yes, these bundles do work. So nothing that we've shown you is rocket science. None of the individual pieces of work are hugely statistical significant, statistically significant, but you know, you, you're all familiar with this from the British cycling team and Team Sky. This is the aggregation of marginal gains. The philosophy is searching for tiny margins of improvement in everything you do, and then that will hopefully add up to something big. And when I was looking at this over the weekend, I was fascinated to see that actually Team Sky got a surgeon to show people how to wash their hands um, to, to reduce the chances of them catching a cold and therefore impairing their performance in cycling. So we believe that it's lots of small steps that eventually can bring something together. Um, and so to conclude, I hope um, you think we've uh, shown you we understand our local data, um, we understand our local epidemiology and our risk factors. Um, that we're working collaboratively across the whole healthcare economy. Um, we've got a number of leaders, um, in particular some of our surgeons, as well as uh, the more people you traditionally think would be helping us out. Um, and it's about the importance of attention to detail. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening and I'm very happy to take any questions um, is there a Q&A session later? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>